I see Walters has got a question, and I'm going to bring uh, Walters in. Um, hey, it's great to see you. You may Hi. know. Yeah, uh, it's not a question, just uh, I won't be able to attend the uh, the whole class today I have to uh, I have to go to an event uh, but uh, just wanted to quickly show I'm in Denmark right now and out sketching so oh. I've got about 10 minutes left and then I'm going back home so oh wow. beautiful weather over here that's absolutely gorgeous um, sketching some some goldfinches that were on these plants uh, picking some seeds and then uh, stone chats that are further up there um, a family of six preparing for migration so oh well gosh 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 look at this landscape um, hey everybody welcome to Denmark um, could we see that stone chat again yeah. Ooh. John Busby would be very pleased. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really fun. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. hey, what about this? What, uh, Walters, would it be possible for, while you're here with us, to set up your camera? Um, and to, to, to point out at the landscape that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we'll all um, do, uh, uh, we'll, while you're with us, we'll do a little Denmark landscape uh, drawing session. We can, I can just uh, hold, uh, I can just hold the phone. You just have to decide no. which, which way you want to go. Do you want to have those fields or the forest on the other side. Which uh, let's one? go back towards those fields. We'll get that hedgerow in, but then you won't be able. Is there any like a post or a, a uh, rock? I, I will be able. I will be able. I just sketch with my other hand. I hold it, hold my phone with this one, and sketch with the other one. Oh man! So that's possible. for folks at home. If you are 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 feeling this is a challenge, just imagine. If you were uh, then having to hold your phone with your other hand and get your sketch on on those goldfinches at the same time, so um, I am. While we're looking at this, um, I am going to uh, bring in. Hold on a second. I think there were some horses up ahead. It would be fun to get those in the sketch, but I I don't know where are they at the moment. All right. I am Let's see. I'm going to turn over to my document camera here. And let's take a look at how I might make a quick landscape ito of this environment that Walters is looking at. So uh, because we don't want Walters' arm to get tired, we're going to make this fast. So landscape pito style. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an open box. So I'm not drawing the top of the sky on it yet, because later on when I'm figuring out my composition, um, there, that's when I'm going to figure out how high my sky goes up. Generally in composition, you don't want the land to be halfway through it. See how Walters has things framed? Not, there's, there's less, um, there's more sky. That's, that's good composition. That's a nice composition. Uh, there's a hedgerow coming in from the right. I either want to start it over here or over here. I don't want that hedgerow to go hit right in the middle. It'll be a little bit more of an interesting composition if it's a little bit more off the side. So I'm going to put mine over here. And that is going to be sweeping off in this direction. So there's going to be the, I'm guessing is a hedgerow. 
there's going to be some plants. There's a tree that is sticking up over there and there. So that is what I'm going to do in terms of just framing this in. Now, everybody squint at the screen, squint at the screen. Notice how much darker the ground is from the sky. That's the contrast that we want. You can see it so much more easily when we squint. But think of how easy it would be to make that sky as dark as the ground. We tend to do that. And then we go like, why doesn't my value range really work in this picture? So I'm gonna have initially just a, a limited palette of, of values here. I'm gonna do a, a little, I'm gonna look out there at the horizon and here I have, whoops, I, want, I don't want this pencil. I want, aha, this pencil. I've got mechanical pencil with 0.7, millimeter lead in it so it's pretty thick it's dark and i'm just noticing that that skyline kind of comes along and then it has dips down there's places where some of the trees are out and then it kind of comes along wiggly and then it dips down and then it comes along and has another little bump and it dips down and then it comes up and over and then there's a tree i'm just going to put a few little marks like that and then we are going to come along. Hey, Valters, it's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. And I want to say to people that to get your sketches on because I think my phone is about at 3% maybe. So. Ah, okay. When, when Valters drops out, we're going to hit this by memory. Um, so in this area here, the sky is going to be pale. I'm going to just put in some light indicators of some cloud shapes. They're very horizontal. Notice how horizontal the clouds are near the horizon. Hori we'll talk about why this is later, but out here we're seeing linear clouds. And then they're getting a little bit bigger. And a little bit bigger and then up here we're getting wow, that's interesting so we've got these why are there different cloud shapes in the sky a big part of that is the perspective um and we'll we'll unpack why that is later but this is a pattern that you will regularly see so this is the white zone down here a little bit of warm yellow brown i'm going to put yellow brown um then there is a uh, cyan, and then there is more of a, a cerulean blue, and I'm and I'm making these little notes just off on the side about where kind of the heights of these zones are in my sky. And <clears throat> now for this hedgerow. I am going to make some marks in here that'll be the bottom of the hedgerow. But as I do that, I want to imagine that there's some pale grasses sticking up in front of it. So what I'm gonna do is as I'm drawing the bottom of this hedgerow, I am also, I'm actually drawing the shape of, of grasses that are sticking up in that hedgerow and i'm i want to think of this as being these lines as the my, the thing i keep saying is consistently inconsistent now i can't quite tell if that distant tree is on this side of the yeah i think that there's that so there my hedgerow comes along i'm going to make kind of a just a bumpily top of this and And so, so watch this. See that with this line here, I'm going to turn that into the grass on the bottom by putting a little top on it. And then I am going to make it dark. So I'm just going to come here with my pencil and shade across here. One value. And because my pencil is blunt and I'm using this sort of large dark this large thick pencil um it covers that territory really really fast 
And now I'm going to put in just a few suggestions of the clumps of vegetation that cut into this. So you see how I'm making a little a little kind of bumpy edge thing here. And then that feels like, oh, there's a little place where you can, maybe you can get through this, this hedge a little bit right in there. Maybe if I kind of come in here, there's a place where, so these little shadows along the bottom and kind of cutting into this, and those help us sort of see the shape of this hedgerow as being something kind of with foliage and coming up here. And also I'm going to imagine that the top edge of it can catch a little bit more light than the side that is here. So the, the sun is shining down here, making this top darker. I'm just going to put along this surface here just a little bit of darker. So I've got this rough edge on the bottom that feels like there are little grasses that are sticking up in front of it. I have a big mass dark thing here and I've carved into that just like this, you know, a few little kind of places where I'm making kind of a wedge going out into it with a rough top and a rough bottom. And what that's suggesting is that there's a place that you could, you know, start to kind of get through this hedge. Then in the background there, this is such a beautiful landscape you're in, Walters. I'm just going to put in a little bit of dark back there. And I'm guessing that that, oh, we've lost Walters. It wasn't that fun. Wasn't it cool to check in with what's going on in Denmark? Oh. <laughs> uh, nothing is rotten in Denmark. Uh, it's so cool to see Walters uh, out there journaling away. All right, so let's, I think that this tree is on in, out in this field. So I'm gonna put it kind of coming down here and then it sticks up above the horizon edge there. And then there's a little bit of tone back there. Now, um, what about, the grasses and stuff here that are in front of me? Ooh, ooh, okay. Let's think about, now when I do this, and I make marks like that with my pencil, oh, um, is that, is that, uh, let, let's join um, the Brewer family here. And there is a little question that we've got at this point. So I am going to, you can now unmute and I'm going to add you into the spotlight. Hey there, you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Can you come to South Lake Tahoe, California and teach a class here? Oh, that sounds like a really fun thing to do. Um, it'd be fun to meet and do something in person. You know, I'm starting to think about doing live events. As a matter of fact, tomorrow, the Nature Journal educators are getting together and we're talking about how can we do live events safely. Um, but it would be really fun to come out there. And I, I love the Sierra Nevada. And uh, it would be fun to kind of bop around South Lake Tahoe, all those cool granite boulders connecting into the water. What is your favorite, what is the place that you think would be really fun to go with a group of people and do journaling together? Um, do you have a favorite adventure place? I kind of like the Winnemucca trail hike. I think it's really a um, good place to nature journal and stuff, yeah. That, that sounds really cool. Um, so at this point, I don't have any visits to South Lake Tahoe area on um, my, my calendar, but um, could you ask your folks to shoot me an email with a reminder to investigate that and I'll be in touch with them. Should I set one, something up, I will definitely let them know and let you know. Okay, thanks. That'd be a lot of fun. Did you like seeing Denmark? Yeah, it was really beautiful. 
That was, wasn't that? The sky was stunning. I'm really looking forward to painting that sky. I've got a couple of tricks to do that really fast with watercolor. And so we'll be, we'll be taking a look at that in just a moment. Okay. Great. Um, Here's so, my drawing if you want to see. Oh, yes. yes. Let me bring you I back. I haven't finished yet. Those wines, they're supposed to be clouds, but. Oh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Oh, good contrast there. Yeah. Nice, have... strong, strong hedgerow. I like that a lot. Mm -mm. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the rest of this drawing from memory. And what I want to do is to take a look at how you can get something that suggests a grassy field. And the problem that I have, I don't know if you've had this problem, if I'm drawing in all the grasses as little dark lines, very often those light grasses that are in front of me are one of the brightest things that I see. So I see a little light grass stem, but then I draw in a dark pencil line. And so very often, you know, the more grasses I get in there, the less it looks like I've got all these light colored grasses. So I've got a little trick and want to show you my trick. Check this out. See this little tool? This is a little tool that is made, it's called an embossing tool, and it's made for when uh, people do pottery, they'll often use these little tools to kind of mark, mark things out like with, with that. If you don't have one of these, a great no cost embossing tool is to find a dead ballpoint pen. If you have a pen, like one of the ones that you've got there, uh, uh, if you have a ballpoint pen that has run out of its, um, out of its uh, ink, that's right, it's called ink, um, then you can use that. Another thing that you can do is, although you have to be a little bit more careful with this, is if you have a mechanical pencil, and you make sure you get the lead completely retracted. This is a little bit harsher on the paper, but you'll see that this works. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to make some scratches in the paper. And when I put these scratches down, they're, they're not going anywhere. They are there for keeps. And the, um, so when I, if I, decide I don't want one of these scratches to be there, I'm out of luck. The other thing that I have to be wary of is that the way that scratches with work, work with pencil is the opposite of the way they're going to work with watercolor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're going to take a look at, at, at how this is kind of at first a problem and then what's a workaround for that. So let's first just do this as a graphite drawing. And then we'll play with watercolor on it. Here we go. There we are. So out here in out here in the fields, um, I want people to see this as a flat plane going across. And I want them to feel that it has grasses in it and vegetation that is sticking up. I'm going to put in, uh, let me show you how this works. Uh, I come over here and if I make some scratches with this tool. And then I color over that. Those scratches appear through. But you say, I don't have the embossing tool. All right, let's take the lead out <laughs> of my pencil here. And now I'm going to draw some scratches with that pencil and go across it. Whew, that works too. Um, if I press a little bit harder, I get a deeper line
and those show up. Now, I'm going to put some of these in, but as I do, I don't want to do too much. I just want to have this be a, a little bit of, of an effect. And actually, let me show you what sort of shapes I'm going to be making. I'm going to be making marks like this. So, so some I'm going to have little things at different distances from me. And there'll be some places where I'm going to imagine that there is some sort of clump of vegetation in front of me. And so that then there'll be some things that are sort of sticking up underneath that. So some places I'll be making some of these marks and they'll kind of have they'll have a common base that is suggesting at something in front of them here. And a number of these I'm also going to take down to the bottom of the page here. And I put some in over here, I'm gonna put some in over here. I'm going to, I'm not gonna evenly put them all the way across the bottom here because consistently inconsistent is your friend. And out here, I'm making some that are little ones in lines like this. They're shorter and they're gonna be in lines, suggesting a place where out there I am seeing now, often if you take your own head and you put it at a little bit of a tilt, you can see the marks that you're making. All right, <clears throat> I've got some marks in here. Remember, um, when you are, I want this to feel like, remember how much darker this ground was than the sky, but it has to be a lighter value than the hedgerow over here. So I'm going to make horizontal lines here. Actually, first I'm going to just flatten the tip of my, my lead. So you see I've made a little kind of scribble over here. As I'm doing that, I am um, making a little chisel shape towards the bottom of my, my pencil that allows me to... Now look at this. Here's a little bit, an area where there's a heavier mark going across, a lighter mark going across. Everybody's kind of keeping horizontal. And some places you can see those streaks through. But as I go into the distance, those streaks are going to be smaller. I'll have bigger ones like this up closer to me. And then there are, you can see some of these little sticks sticking up. I know that right now it looks like it doesn't look like grasses. This does not look like grasses, but I do want to have some of these little light areas in this area. I'm now going to turn this into grasses and I'm going to think, um, but I'm going to, but these are just going to help me have some, get, initially get a little bit of tone in there, a little bit of something suggesting that these are flat fields. And now we're going to work on the texture of this field, particularly in the bottom and the middle zone here. So we're going to think of this area in two different sections. There's going to be the, the zone closest to me where I'm going to draw some big plants. And then there's going to be the zone further away where I'm going to have a suggestion of plants. And then there's going to be the third zone up there where I'm not going to put any detail in. So I'm breaking this up into this front area where I'm going to now I'm, I'm making more sort of lines that are suggesting you know, here is I'm suggesting that there are sort of vertical plants and out here in the middle, kind of getting out here. See, I'm now making sort of smaller lines. And out here in this area, I'm, I'm making little squiggly horizontal marks.
Lastly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the foreground here, imagine that I have, there's a, there's a clump of grass coming over this way, there's a clump of grass coming over this way, um, another clump of grass coming up here. These places between those clumps right here and right here are going to make these sort of darker places that um, I'm going to punch in towards the bottom of these, just some darker elements. Sometimes they're triangular shaped. And these are the, some of the, ending up kind of the clumps between the places where you're sort of seeing into, into a place where a little vole went scooting into there. And try not to get evenly sized, evenly spaced little marks. No, 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 no. Um, consistently inconsistent. And what this does is it adds contrast into the foreground and makes that feel a little bit closer. I need some things that are some grasses that are kind of bent over. And there also there was a lot of these little things out there where vaulters were where there was a little dark seed pod or pod on top of thing. I think that this gold those gold finches were on top of there. So I'm going to just I'm going to put in a few little dots. I don't have to necessarily connect them to a little stick. If I do this, it looks like a cartoon. But those dots, you know, they just sort of seem to be floating out there. So I'm putting some of those dots into the foreground. <clears throat> oh yeah, Valters, absolutely. We will put up a recording of this. Um, thank you so much for, for being with us. If Valters is back, maybe we can get... Um, uh, if, yeah, Valters, if, if you're, you're back and have access to the phone, just uh, do use the raise hand function. Um, otherwise, we'll just uh, assume that you're not able to do that and we're... No, I'm here, but I'm back home uh, with my phone charging, but the landscape is looking really accurate. So... Um, oh, awesome. <laughs> looking very good. Yeah, and those goldfinches where those... I don't know what the flowers are called, but they have like uh little um little balls spiky balls on top of them and the and the goldfinches uh go to them and uh, get them open with their beaks and then uh pick the seeds out so yeah so the naturalist in me wants to draw a little line in here i'm gonna make it a squiggly line like this mm -hmm. a little arrow um, the squiggly line like this um, sometimes um, it's a little bit easier to read those as if I have a straight line coming in it you think it's going to be part of the picture but this is sometimes engineers and things will use these little kind of squiggly lines especially when there's a lot of straight lines in here that that sort of stands out different and I can say goldfinch feeding here. How many goldfinch did you see out there? Um, approximately 50 to 60. That's so cool. And your goldfinches, the goldfinches you have out there, totally different than our goldfinches in the United States. Uh, yeah. Really beautiful colors. Yeah, they have this all red, uh, all red uh, faces. And when they uh, when they are flying, you it like the wings look like gold because they are they have a mm -hmm. couple of yellow patches. So yeah. it's really beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that's that is wonderful. Now, in terms of my composition here, I want whoop whoop. There we go. I want I don't want there to be the same amount of ground as there is sky. And um, so if I were to, to crop this like that, 
I'd have the same amount of ground as sky and it would be kind of a static composition. Um, instead, I want to show more of that sky. So that's why I initially didn't draw the top on my box because sometimes I get more ground and then I realize I just need to make my sky zone a different proportion. I want the sky all to be lighter than my, uh, my ground here. And um, I, at this point, I really need to, to make a decision. Do I want to do this with graphite pencil or do I want to do this with watercolor? And the reason um, with the ground, I can at this point, I can get away with having, you know, uh, painting over this ground. But I cannot do that in the sky because if I get a lot of dark graphite into the sky, it's going to make for this sort of dark gray sky once the color is in there. So um, I tend not to do a shaded tone drawing of my sky and tint that if I am going to be doing watercolor over it. If I were to be doing a, um, a sky in, let's see, you're my 0.5, I want my, if I were to be doing a sky that was in, uh, the, uh, sorry, the page. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's just imagine that I were, decided to do this with my, um, with pencil, I would lightly, no pressure, no pressure, um, I would lightly put in some strokes into the sky. And then um, I need to find where my little blending tool ran off to. I was looking for that the other day, couldn't find it. I can't find one again, so I am going to make one out of this check stub. And so I've, I'm tightly rolling a little piece of paper here. And I am going to smooth that together. And then to create those cloud effects, I would come in with a, a sharp sort of pencil like eraser. And I can put in some of these horizontal clouds down here. And then as I am coming up here, I can make bigger clouds up there in the sky. So I get this gradation of value. I get those big, broad, come on, you rascal, um, things up there, medium-sized clouds in the middle, and then skinny clouds towards the horizon. The reason you see this is that as you are, uh, a lot of these clouds are forming in sheets. There are sheets of clouds. And so if I'm out here and I'm looking down at the edge of that, then I see it as a long form here. But that same cloud here above me, I'm looking up at it. And so when I'm looking up here, um, I'm looking more at the underside of the cloud. So essentially, if these are frisbees in the sky, I'm looking up at them here. And as they get more cl closer to the horizon, you're seeing them more edge on. Whoops, we're off the screen. Oh, there we go. Ah, frisbees. All right, so here's big. Um, here I'm not so much worrying about making things be smaller as they recede into the distance, but yes, that too. So these ones up here, they're going to be big and they're going to go off the screen. So 
So let's make this a big Frisbee. Um, it might help to back up just one. Um, oh, you're right. What? So big, and you're seeing the underside of the Frisbee, bigger, more rounded up here. And as you get towards the horizon, you're getting smaller and you're getting more horizontal. So you're getting smaller and you are getting flatter towards the horizon. Now I wanna show you my strategy for getting these cool clouds in an easy way. There it is, the white crayon. Oh yeah. Um, what I'm gonna do is in here, actually first I'm gonna come along and I'm gonna erase some of these marks. And I'm gonna put in a little white Now I want these to, again, consistently inconsistent. As I go up in the screen here and up on the page, these are going to get bigger. If I hold my head kind of at the side, I can see the shape of the marks that I'm making. You can't see them, but maybe if I tilt and I know it doesn't really show up on the screen. And then all the way at the top there. And I'm going to big cloud shape coming up in here and another one that is over here and that's going to go off off my screen now that i've and i can again i tilt my page i'll be able to see by the sheen exactly where these are they look white if i look straight down on it they're invisible i look at an oblique angle here and these I clearly have one here one here a couple of smaller ones here maybe I want another small one in here medium size and then we're getting smaller towards the horizon now what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint on top of this going from cobalt to more of a cyan to more of a, a pale a white yellow. So it's going to be getting lighter and doing a color change as we go down here. That on top of these little cloud effects will look pretty cool. My favorite water brush. All right. I'm going to start with some of that up sky blue and a really good thing to do is just to put some paint on your palette and look back at the sky, hold it up to the sky and say, is that the color that I want? If so, great. If not, great. I can change it and you can tweak that color. Maybe I add in more ultramarine. Do I like that better? Yeah, I do. Okay. Then, um, that is going to come down here and it's going to start to fade now there are three color changes that i can make that i'm going to want to make and i'm going to do this the easy way and that is i'm first going to put in my first color and have it fade i'm then let that dry i'll put in my second color let that fade and dry then put in my third color so let's get our first color in here and um, notice as I come up against the edge of these forms here that I get that kind of rough edge where those clouds are. And I'm 
out here in the middle. I, I can actually paint in the middle of this because, um, actually, while this is still wet, let's kind of continue down here. Notice my water brush is running out of paint. All right, if I go back into this right now with a dark brush or a wet brush, it'll make all sorts of weird marks in my sky and I will be sad. So I'm just gonna let that sit there. I'm going, I actually would like that to be a little bit darker, but if I do that right now, I will be sad because I will put weird blotchy marks into my sky. So I'm gonna mess around with the ground here a little bit. And while that's, while I'm doing that, this is gonna be drying up there. I'll then put another coat into that top part and then work with my next color and then my next color. But meanwhile, down here on the ground, not really remembering exactly what it was, but it was, uh, things were turning pretty brown there and maybe there was a little bit of green. And test that color off on the side. There's sort of a gunky brown. And I like that. I'm going to put a little bit of color variation into that. Maybe there, I don't really remember. I'd want to be out there and look, were there some kind of some green clumps? While it's a little bit damp, I can put in kind of blotchy marks here. Meanwhile, my sky's been drying. I'm gonna to wanna to let this stuff down here dry a little bit more. And then I'll come back in and mess with that ground and those hedgerows. But let's play with that sky again. I'm cleaning my brush, a little bit of a squeeze and a wipe on my sock. Load back up with some paint and let's just kind of come on down there again. I'm gonna go for just sort of a nice clean edge up here and then I am, yeah, that's what I want. I want to get those clouds showing up a little bit more. And it's fading down there. Look how nicely those clouds show up in that, in that space. Now, what's happening down here. I'm gonna let this stuff dry. I don't even have to clean this blue out of my brush. I'm gonna be painting with some sort of brownish greeny colors. Um, and uh, it's okay for me to have a little bit of gunk on my brush here. If I were doing something clean in the sky, I wouldn't do that. So I'm not even gonna clean my brush. I'm just gonna now get into the hedgerows. And I'm going to get some initially lighter color here. And then I'm going to just take some dark. So this is just gunk of brown and black in the dark part of my palette. And right here along the bottom of the hedgerow. That distant tree line back there, I'm going to make, take a little bit of blue, mix that in with my, this is an indathrone blue, which is a nice dark color. Test that, is that, and it's sort of a blue gray, and I'm going to paint this just as a solid color, this area in the back. And that will really push that back. So no detail, but I want, I want strong contrast back there. Now, my sky's been drawing a little bit more. Maybe I want some extra dark accents down here. Sometimes you would take color that I used here and I put that into other places in the drawing. That gives kind of a visual unity to the whole painting. Um, if I'm constantly bringing in different colors, then um, that sometimes makes it look like a calico hodgepodge. 
but by having the same color appear up again, so it's a limited palette idea. I can have as many colors as I want on my palette, but then on my page, I'm gonna be using more of a limited palette. Now I'm going to take sort of, I uh, want some sort of a cyan -y turquoise color here. And I am going to paint that across here. Get a little bit of rid of a little bit of the color in my brush off on the side and fade that up and then on the bottom edge fade it down now I'm getting in here and I'm see how I'm fussing around with it and it's making these weird sort of bald spots and lines up here. I just put down a wash and left it alone here. I fussed with it and notice it's much more kind of streaky down here in this part of the sky. That's because I was getting fussy. I should have patience and and wait. All right, but I let there's my second color in the sky. I'm now going to go back to the ground. <clears throat> I'm going to bring some warm value colors, some of these oranges and yellows, into part of what is going on here in the foreground. And that will bring my foreground forward just a little bit. A little bit back here and my brush is running out of paint and so that that I get a little fade of that as we go back in space. That little bit of warm color in there will help pull that foreground forward. Now, I am going to put, there was in this part of the sky, there was a little bit of yellow ochre brown. So I'm getting a little bit of brown from my palette. And I don't want a lot of brown, just a little bit where there's almost none on my brush. And I'm going to put some of that into the sky back here. And that's just going to warm the bottom of this up. Now, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, what do I want to do? I think I actually do want a more kind of heavy blue coming down here. This is feeling still a little bit too pale for me. So um, I like this part down here, but I'm gonna, this part's up here is dry, I think. Yes, it is. And so I'm just gonna get one last wash into that part of the sky. Test my color. Ooh, I'm glad I did because look at how gray that is. I don't want that. So, Sometimes if I don't test my color, oh, that's even grayer. I must have some real gunk on the side of my palette. Test, that's acceptable. And I am coming across here. I'm going quickly, not really pausing. And my brush is slowly running out of paint. In here, there's a few drops of paint that are sitting on top of the wax from the crayon. So I'm just coming in here with a clean brush and lifting those out. Take those out. They make sort of a harsh spotty effect.
a little bit of metadata. Want to know where this is, when it is. Um, and there we go. What a what a beautiful beautiful landscape you've got there, Valters. And I'm just delighted that you get to roam around in this space and um, see all those incredible birds. Um, let's now jump over to comments and questions and thoughts and ideas. Um, if you have um, you have a, uh, a a question or a comment, you can use the raise hand function. Um, you can also use the um, just sort of wave at me at this on the screen, and I will be looking for you. But let's jump over to the Brewer family again. And hey there, it's good to have you with us. And you may now unmute. I like that shirt. Sorry about that. Took a minute. No uh, worries. So I have a question. Do stone centipedes live in Lake Tahoe? Um, yes, they should. I think that, oh. did you find something that looked like that? Um, a few years ago, I was looking in a stump and a giant yellowish brown centipede came out and, and I just remembered and I put it in my, um, nature oh. journal, but I wanted to make sure I labeled it correctly. Yeah, so I put uh, it that, in the centipede. Are, are, are those can be so surprising. Yeah. Uh, could you, could you take another funny. look at your centipede? I would love to get a closer look at that. Let me get, uh, I'm gonna minimize my screen, so we'll uh, make that bigger. Oh, yes. And no, I noticed how you've observed that the, there are those ones in the back that point back and and the sides of the body, there is one pair of legs per body segment. Millipedes have two pairs of legs per body segment. So you've got a bunch of uh, really great observations here. It's also great that you noticed the habitat that this was in, where you are, are, are saying that this came out of a tree stump. I see that you're counting segments, you're measuring the body, you've got words, pictures, and numbers here and this is a wonderful set of observations. Okay, thanks. Wow, oh, that was really cool. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, do you, before I go, can I also um, share my Denmark thing? Yes, let's check out your Denmark. Uh, I'm going to remove my spotlight. Ah, ah. Really get a sense of the difference between the um, the the ground plane in front of you and the 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 sky with those different colors swirling around in it. Thanks. And you're using you're using markers. Yes, I am using markers. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's really fun. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, I hope you uh, continue to have great adventures looking for animals around the South Lake Tahoe area. There is there's so many cool critters and birds and squirrels. And also, you're in an environment that just like uh, vultures in Denmark, beautiful, beautiful landscapes. Yes. Oh, and um, I have one more question. I saw this um, when I was hiking up at Winnemucca at Frog Lake yesterday but I don't know the name. So oh, right. know what name it is? Let's take a close look here. Uh, we've got little purple um, tips. Now, are the, or I'm seeing those little leaves that are coming out in clusters of, are they coming out um, all from the same point? Yes. So, They're ah. coming out from the same point. So, so there's a little stalk that comes up, and then there's a platform of leaves, often with eight little leaves that will be kind of in a circle. There was actually, I count ten. I count ten leaves on one, but I did count one with eight, too. That's really cool. Um, 
I wonder That's if a picture we... of the seed pod too. Oh, good. So there's, so then they have long seed pods and yeah. do the seed pods open up kind of like a long book? That, 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 that analogy like doesn't work. A long stem and then individual, individual crumbly seed pods on the stem thing, but it was like brown. There was individual seed pods along it. Oh, how interesting. Um, I want to bring in our resident botanist here. Um, I, I'm looking at the, 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 the leaves and it's making me think lupin. Um, the seed pod, I'm not sure, what, what are your thoughts on that? Hold on a second, I, uh, I'll, I'll remove the spotlight so that we make you bigger. I was definitely thinking something fabaceous, um, especially with the way that, so you're saying that the seed pods sort of unravel, sort of like open up like a corkscrew? Is that sort of what you were saying? No, it was like, so it was um, like a long, a brown stem, and then there were little like teacup seed pods on the outside with the seed in the middle. Mm, teacup seed pods. Oh, this yeah, is, this is, like tea this is fun. I, now we, we've got a, a challenge for you. And that is to, to um, if it's possible to find this book again, I mean, this uh, flower again, to see if we can get um, more information about those seed pods. Um, okay. This and, is um, really cool. If it, would, if it would help you anything, the soil quality was sandy, pebbly, and dry. And it was also dusty, and it was about maybe three yards away from a lake. Oh, that kind of information is so helpful to us as scientists. Um, the when you um, are looking at the that the habitat, when you're looking at the 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 habitat like that you're thinking like a scientist, you're thinking like an ecologist. So I want to really compliment you for getting information there on that seed pod. This is really exciting. And one, I'm actually, that was for the mostly the flower and a bee came and pollinated it. Oh, these are, that might be even good to write in just a little note, pollinated by bees. Right. It was about medium-sized bee, if that helps you at all. That's great. This No, that's that's really, really good. You are a very keen observer. Mm -hmm. This is, we this is terrific. We Sierra Nevada guide, but we couldn't find it anywhere. All right. If it's, if it's possible um, to... Um, let's get even see if there's any other notes if you find this plant again have you ever found this down near where you live i i've seen it a few times on hikes before but i never knew what it was Excellent. and there were um, and there was other individual clusters of the same plant and like there was a cluster of the same exact plant but it had five flowers instead of one about two feet away and the colors of the flowers are more are sort of purpley, pinkish purple. Yes, pinkish purple. Okay, um, this is this is great. You are making excellent observations. I want to to challenge you to keep your eyes open for for this mystery plant, and the next time you see it, make a fresh set of observations. And the challenge is, the first time you looked at it, you noticed this and this and this. See if in this next time you look at it, there are other aspects of its shape or structure that maybe you didn't even see before. And on the second time, you get to know it a little bit better and record those in your journal. And would you bring those back to us if you find it again? Yes. I'll Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is this is really, really exciting. So that, that's... Welcome. You, you're really kind of representing the, the skills of a naturalist very, very well.
Hmm. And by the way, my name is Finn, if you didn't know. I, I didn't know. Um, and uh, Finn, it's really, really nice to meet you. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to write that down because if I don't write things down, I forget them. And it's been so nice to meet you. Um, Finn, it's, it's a really a pleasure to meet you too. Um, do you have a copy of the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling? Uh, hold on, we can, uh, you can now unmute. Oh, wait, wait, you're still muted. Uh, try, try to hit the unmute button. Uh, we have that here, too. Okay, good. We're going to send you a copy if you didn't have that, um, uh, because you're you're really representing the just mad naturalist skills. Um, I Again, I so appreciate that you are not just getting tunnel vision on the flower, but you're noticing the environment around it. What is it substrate? What is, you know, this is this, you know, how, how, how wet or dry is the soil? What is the nature of the soil near it? And what is coming to it, looking at the butterflies and things like that. Finn, this is, is terrific. And I really look forward to seeing you again. Okay, I'll come back next week. Great. Be Bye. well. Bye bye, Finn. Thanks. Thank you. That was a really cool set of observations. Um, I am uh, taking a look around. If anybody else has other things that you'd like to share, just raise your hand. Let's join Jack. Uh, great to see you. Hello. Oh, you can now unmute. There we go. Hey. Um, so, my Denmark. Ah, oh, lovely, lovely. Yep, and, and I noticed you put a little bit of a shadow underneath the edge of that cloud, and that really gave it much more volume. And the other day, um, right, there was a spider web under the flood, a floodlight of our gazebo, and I noticed that a green stink bug was um, trying to get out and after like a minute he stopped and I'm wondering if he was conserving his energy for when the spider came out. Oh, what an interesting hypothesis. As like a last minute chance to get out. Yep, yep. And That's also saw a, a yellow jacket checking him out. Um, was the, other was day, the yellow jacket caught in the web or just coming over to where the stink bug was? It was hovering where, where he was. It was not so. But the other day was really crazy. On in our window there was another spider web, and I forget what kind of bug. It might have been a click bug. No, it wasn't a click bug. It was I don't know what bug it was, but it was stuck in the web. And I think it was a yellow jacket. Came right in, grabbed it with all of its arms. The bug that was in the web and was pulling and pulling, and then it couldn't get couldn't get it out. And then eventually napped it right out of the web and flew away. Like totally. Whoa! Scared. Jack, that's crazy. So let me get this straight. So yellow jackets were robbing spider webs. Oh, wow. That is, that is, I mean, talk, I think it would, I would think that that would be a risky behavior. You know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna grab some seal snacks from the jaws of the great white shark. So let's just kind of get out there and kind of get some of those chunks of seal that the shark's eating. I don't think I would wanna go swimming there to try to get those seal chunks, but this thing was getting bugs out of a spider web. That is really fun. And um, the other day, I've never seen this type of spider before. Maybe I just haven't, haven't really seen it, but um and so super cool looking spider so many different coloration um oranges and greens in its abdomen a maple orchard spider i found in a azalea the other day. Oh! it is such a cool spider oh my gosh so long abdomen with stripes going down it 
Oh, that is so cool. And what is it called? A Mabel Orchard Spider with a B, Mabel. Um, and it had this, so there was like a thicker web that went across um, from one branch to another branch of the azalea. And it had this like thing that reminded me of a seat, a pot of peas without the pot. So a bunch of peas lined up. Um, and I've, I've watched him for the last few days and he's been working on this. Um, a couple of days I was watching him um, day after day. And every time I saw him, he was working on this, whatever he was doing. So it, it was very interesting. Now, what do you think that might be? I think maybe like, I can't, I can't imagine those seeds or like eggs. I don't know, maybe they're eggs. I don't know, but maybe like a bunch of um, insects lined up. I don't know. All right, ooh, so ooh, ooh. I, I love, can I just say mad points for coming up with two different uh, uh, hypotheses there? So you said maybe they're eggs um, or maybe they are insects lined up that it's caught. And what I particularly like here is that you, um, you came up with more than one hypothesis because if we just come up with one, we tend to think of like, yes, it's insects lined up or yes, it's eggs. And, but the minute you come up with a second hypothesis, it helps your brain be a lot more flexible. Um, Want to see something interesting so I'm going to join you on the screen here. So keep your spider up there. I'm going to run over there. I'll be right back with something, something. And so um, before COVID, zapped me in Ecuador. <laughs> um, let, let me show you what I was geeking out on there. And Oh, wow. What kind of spider is that? It also has a long body like yours. It, um, this one had green legs. Uh, yeah, mine, I, mine I observed almost like a dark legs, but in the Tarsus, it was almost, I didn't get it very good in my painting, but it was almost like a golden, um, translucent golden in the Tarsus. Oh, wow. That is, that is cool. That one, that one's really cool. It's golden legs and like a creamy white abdomen with almost like tiger stripes running down from the tip. Yeah, and you know what's here, weird? I'm looking at also um, uh, photographs of Mabel orchard spiders on line here, and a bunch of them have green legs. I wonder if these are in the same family or the same genus. Yeah. And I also see a crab orb weaver. Is that a crab orb weaver up top? Oh, top right? isn't that a cool? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really cool. I've never seen one of those, but I've seen pictures and they're cool looking. Yeah, this this little one, I, I saw what was neat is that this one was right in the middle of an orb web in the middle of a trail by the side of a vacant lot, right at face wow. level. And so I was walking around, looking around, and all of a sudden I realized that this thing was sitting right in front of my face. I'm like, oh, you want to be sketched, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Actually, wait, I had seen, I forgot, um, a couple of days ago during um, on a trail, a couple times across the trail there would be a bunch of webs, and it was those, although they weren't yellow. They were, I think it was like a um, deep red and some other colors, but yeah, I, I actually have seen those in there are super cool. That's really fun. Yes, more spiders, right? That would make life better. And that was it. Oh yeah, um, I also did a little blobby. Oh, oh, and you're kind of uh, making them more oval as you get towards the sides. Strong work, Jack. Really There's strong work. Fun to draw. 
Blobbies are fun, and blobbies are just great practice, right? Anytime you, if you're you know in the dentist's office and you're waiting for uh, your turn, you can sit there. You can you can you can make a blobby, and 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 you've just learned something about wrapping all those different shapes. That's cool. And seeing you reminds me that I still have not mailed the thing that I picked up for you. I got to get on that. But I am so distracted in such a short attention span that I haven't gone to the mailbox and sent your package yet. But there is one. All right. Um, Jack, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Let's see what's going on in, um, in Kate's journal. Um, hey there, Kate. Um, it is terrific to see you again. Welcome back. You may now unmute. Hey, it's great to be back. So I had a pretty hectic August. I thought I was going to be out of my last summer up in Pacific Northwest for a while. So I tried to cram in as many adventures as possible. And then I decided that I was going to stay up here. Ah, um, oh, so I, that's, that's our loss. Um, but should yeah. you ever get traveling down this way? Oh, we... yeah. Well, my family down there. So I'm sure I will make it down at some point in the near ish future in the next year, at least. Um, and we'll have right. to arrange a meetup. No, no, just seriously, let us know when you're in the neighborhood. And oh, we'll I will. I will. I will. Critical mass of nature journalists together. We'll have a, uh, a, a we get to meet Kate in person fam, uh, party. Nice. That sounds fun. Um, yeah, so I stayed up here. I'm actually living at one of the barns I ride at. It's great. I've got horses up my window and trails and lots of nature all around. The bird watching is phenomenal. Um, and you're also yeah. an archer? Uh, no, my sister's an archer, but I decided to pick it up too because uh, I've been working on buying a horse that I've been training that I think would be really good for mounted archery. And I figured my sister and I can share the horse. I'm really good at riding. She's really good at shooting. So we'll be able to compete and there'll be a handicap on both ends. Oh, that's really yeah. cool. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I did not know that there were uh, competition events where they did mounted archery. I knew there about are, people I don't know doing cross-country but... skiing and shooting rifles, but not mounted archery, which is cooler. Yeah. Um, Sarah, I am in Bellingham, Washington. So, yeah. And I've got the bow there behind me. I've got like a bridle hanging. You can't see it, but I've got yes, the, uh... yes, the, the bridle. You've got your helmet. Yeah. I've got right. saddles hanging off the back end of my bed. It's a whole thing. Um, and then but you also don't need the window. saddles. You do a lot of bareback as well. I do. I do. Yes. Um, a lot of fun. Uh, let's see. What was I getting at? So unfortunately, because I've been on my feet so much and moving around, um, I haven't done too much nature journaling. However, I just sat down and I will show you what I've got for this month. Um, Oh, I wish I could have shown you some of the sketch pages I did, but I put them for sale uh, up at the farmer's market. But those are my Instagram. So I don't know if you've seen these already. This is from a boat trip I did out San Juan Island. I thought it was going to be a, you know, maybe four to six hour boat trip. It was 12. So, uh, yeah, the yeah. three hour tour is sometimes not what you expect. Well, no, yeah. that's the thing. I was sailing my friend Dan's boat, and I thought I can make it from Bellingham to Friday Harbor. Meep, don't drink my paint water. Sorry. Um, <laughs> got to fend off the cat. I thought that we could sail it in, you know, a short amount of time. I was wrong, but it was still a good adventure. Oh, so, so, just these... hold that up. so folks, notice how uh, Kate is handling the waves in the water on the right-hand side there. You're seeing larger marks towards the bottom, um, getting yeah. smaller and more horizontal as they rise up. And yeah, notice so that- some more practice of that as we go through the book. So I got yeah. really intentional with it. Here I was trying to draw some um, just sea life and stuff that I was seeing as we were passing by. It's really hard to sail a boat and draw at the same time, but- you know. So you've got one hand on the main, one hand on the tiller, one hand on your sketchbook. Oh, and you saw an orca! No, we did not. My sister said if you draw them, maybe they'll come. Uh, we saw if you draw, they will... <laughs> Actually, I did see orcas. However, it was at the uh, Friday Harbor Whale Museum, which I have some sketches from. Um, 
these are not from that. This is more islands and more whales and boat stuff. Ooh, um, and there's, there's angles oh, on the dolls, really cool. Yeah, so here's practicing drawing water. Uh, I really want to yes. get good at showing motion in water. Um, however, so the next day we went to the Friday Harbor uh, Whale Museum. I didn't do many whale sketches, but I did do some sketches of um, seals and sea lion skulls they have so many bones there they're all like ethically harvested and stuff um they're a really great museum if you ever have the chance to go and then uh my cousins did some fishing went to visit my cousins in friday harbor my uncle drew these weird little doodles in my sketchbook they pulled up some sculpins didn't necessarily love how they were treating the animals but luckily i was able to toss them back in the water before while great. they weren't looking um yeah there's some just random doodles I was doing off reference pictures. Um, I love the little uh, cormorant. Uh, oh, fish. isn't that fun? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. These were done from life of my friend's dog, Koa. It's Meep's best friend. That's great. It really helps to understand the anatomy. It really does. Yeah. And be able to look at things as that... shapes. Oh, yes. I've been really trying to practice that and get that down. Um, here's some pigeon right guillemots I did. <sighs> Love these birds. These are, they're so much fun. They're little black bird and then they open their mouth and you're like, whoa. Yeah, and their feet too. Gotta love their feet. Mm -hmm. And then here's just some seabird studies I was doing whenever I've got time, I try and pull up Instagram and just scroll through birds. Oh, that's, um, that's a great. A little great anhinga, idea. big anhinga, don't turn into anything. Um, just some sketches, once again, off Instagram. I like to go through, scroll, and uh, just find little compositions I find interesting and try and replicate them. Oh, really strong work. Hang on, Meep is trying to knock over a watering can. I don't know if you can see it. She liked a little raccoon. <laughs> Meep, don't you do that. You don't, uh, don't, don't you, don't even think about it. Oops, too late. Yeah. Anyways, here's some studies of my horse, John. He is exactly the shade of uh, Daniel Smith Potter's pink. So <laughs> really easy to paint. <laughs> so I just have a big blotch of that on my um, thing. There's some more sketches, horses, whale skeletons. Oh, um, oh what fun. Random sketch dump. With a sloth. Um, Bonus sloth. Birds. I've been trying to sketch as much as I can just in my spare time. Hasn't been a lot though, or not as much as usual, you know. You know yeah. how I usually am. That's right. Yeah, usually yeah. it's we've got. Yep. Oh, I went back through at some point and watched your uh, Tucon video, which was really interesting because I remember doing that when I was just starting out. Um, mm -hmm. And then coming back and approaching it later and having so many more tools at my disposal to really capture the shapes. What, what, uh, what, what sort of um, ideas are now in your head that weren't there then that you find yourself really leaning into? Being more confident with loosely sketching out forms instead of trying to draw things as like, uh, this is a bird. It's like, nope, these are all these blobs put together that later become a bird. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it's simple. Okay, cat, you're being removed. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Mostly it's just really training yourself to look for the shapes and um not look at it as a thing and then be able to get the motion of something and like the spirit of it by drawing like the motion lines mm -hmm. i don't know it's just become a lot more intuitive that's hear more two cons i still do the thing of you know when i draw oh, something is that I the draw two a ton of them yes it is uh, yeah. i think there's a few more more studies of my horse try and do like some foreshortening with horses and drawing them at weird angles Oh, that's really fun. We're going to have a, actually a horse drawing workshop where well, you could probably teach it. Um, coming up. <laughs> no, uh, I can't wait to see. We're that. going to do it in cooperation with uh, this uh, horse rescue center. Oh, awesome. Nice. This place that takes horses that have been abused and neglected and uh, gives them a new life. Yeah, that is great work. I mean, I'm gonna see if I can find something like that because I've got some skills with working with horses and rehabilitating them. Anyway, so I got to do some more conventional nature journaling. I did a trip up to Bowen Island in Canada to go visit a friend, and we nature journaled together, which was really cool. Um, so we went on a hike. There were some cattails. We were hiking like a timber bog, and we weren't sure, you know, there's a little question like, 
can turtles get to bogs on islands that are like isolated by sea or the freshwater turtles unless they're introduced? We didn't see any, but you know, we're really curious. Oh, interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a cat that belongs to my friend's neighbors. They didn't know the name. It just screams at us until I let it in and then it slept with me all night. Very strange. <laughs> um, here's the timber bog and um, try to do a little study of the lilies. There's these little ones that um, they've got like this slimy underside that's really fun to play with. Oh, isn't that weird? Isn't that yeah. strange? Yeah. So I'm trying to do a little bit more of the observational nature journaling. It's just hard because either I go out by myself, I'm usually on horseback and I can nature journal then if I remember to bring my kit. And then it, usually I'm with people and I sit down to draw things. You know, come on, Kate, let's go. I'm like, hang on, I'm trying to get the landscape in. Oh. <laughs> So I need more nature journaling friends. I think I'll have to start a nature journaling yeah. club up here. Yes, uh, yes. Getting getting yeah. a critical mass of yep. like-minded. I'm just gonna together. have to do it now. There's no excuse. Yeah, it will it will crazy motivate you. So anybody in Bellingham area? There was one. I got her email a while ago and then I never followed through. So shame on me. I will get better at that. Um, okay, or uh, if you end up starting your own group, just let me know and we'll put you on the interactive map. Oh yeah, of course. Um Okay, so then there's a raven up in BC that um, it was making this really weird noise at us. I'll get the video up on Instagram soon because it's on my camera. But I think he was copying like a car alarm noise from an electric car or something. It sounds very unnatural for a bird. Cat, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, dear. Get off my saddle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Then I'm working on drawing uh, people, just doing little poses and trying to get more comfortable with it. Um, and then also I'm trying to sell some of my art. So I'm making stickers. This one is of Meep licking her toe beans because we took Meep to the beach at night to swim in the bioluminescence. And it's a place where people sometimes go to party a little bit. And there was a very tipsy girl who saw Meep and made up a song about her toe beans for her. So it says, she's got the beans, the toe beans. The only oh, two lyrics we could remember. That is, you know, th those little moments, if we don't put them in a journal, oh, yeah. like that, we forget them. But then. Well, my idea now is to make, I'm going to make weekly meat stickers or, <laughs> and um, sell those cheaply so people can collect them and just make stickers of all the little animals in my life. Um, so um, I hope you can read that. Oh, that is you know, really Colette fun. is a criminal. Colette, yeah. what are you doing? Oh, that that the, the expression on little meep there is so oh, yeah. much fun. It's it's full of crime. Oh yeah. yeah, that is so cool. Yeah, and then Hank is a horse that lives with my horse, and um, I went out to give my horse a treat, and Hank walked over to say hello, and then he got spooked by a chicken and ran over the top of me. So that's not uh, good. he like yeah he clipped my face a little bit, and now the joke is like whenever um, I can't remember saying like oh damn it, Hank, you know, <laughs> don't worry, I'm completely fine, but it makes for a fun little uh, curse word. Wow. Yeah. So oh, that's, that's my so much fun. Uh, hey, this is journal. great. Yeah. Trying to work on uh, getting my art scanned and making prints and stuff and being able to market that. So, yeah. you know. Well, what I, what I love here is that you've got, um, you, you've now got a base, right? You're going to be there for a while. You can put down those roots and yeah. like find well, your Yeah, I have community. a lot of roots find... already, and I was worried about tearing them up. So now I can just build on that foundation. Yes, that's yeah. great. Excellent. Well, it's really yeah, good to see you. you again. Yeah, it's great to see everyone. I can't wait to chat with you all on Pencil Miles again. All right. And again, everybody, uh, oh, yeah, you're getting some big thumbs up from uh, Avea about uh, joining the, the Pencil Miles crew. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, let's join uh, Susan and see what's going on in your world. Hello there. Oh, hold on. You can, you may now unmute. Great. Hello. And I was wondering if you'd spelunked any rabbit holes recently. Oh, well, <laughs> you, you may recall on, on Thursday, I was, I had my little, my little, uh, my, 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 what my friend calls the Piggle Palace because she calls caterpillars caterpiggles. 
so they're pickles. Um, but then I was watching it like a hawk because the caterpillar was all in position. I, like, I remember that. Thinking about it. So the thing is, is I actually, um, uh, and I, I actually did manage to watch it shed its skin. We had till the evening to actually shed and turn into a chrysalis, which is pretty awesome. So I had that. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> the other, the other, uh, um, the other caterpillar that I that I had um, that I was pretty sure was going to overwinter as a caterpillar because we they're supposed supposedly only have two generations, although in this area at least, although it's sort of hard to count. Um, but uh, you know, so we kind of thought that it's probably getting like the, the daylight hours are getting low enough, and then keep it in the window so it gets like natural light that it would it might be like ready to actually overwinter and come out in the spring. Well, last night, no, well, yesterday afternoon, pouring rain outside. I look over at the jar and there is a very large butterfly in there. Spice swallow swallowtails are huge and this one was especially huge, I think. And I was worried it was gonna like beat its wings to death in the yeah. pool. But you but can't I, just I, go I, let it out because it's raining cats and dogs and yeah. butterflies. Well, yeah. well, the thing is, yes, it was raining uh, I mean, uh, up and down, but also we're not, I'm not in like, I mean, I did release one of them previously in this area and there's plenty of nectar plants for it, but we're not really, there's, I, don't, I don't see spice with swallowtails around like this sort of neighborhood that much. Um, and there are, as far, I can't find any of the food plants with the caterpillars. So I, had, I figured, you know, they're very strong flyers. If, um, you know, the one that I did release before, I'd like it, it can it will make its way without too much difficulty to the place but if you're in the rain no and i thought i could wait till today but then it was raining really today and the forecast was for rain so i took it out so I, I got i transferred it into a larger like actual butterfly enclosure that has like netting that it can hang out of got in the car drove out to the albany pine bush <laughs> carried it along the trail to a nice place that was enough in the trees that it could have some cover. And the rain had was kind of like just, just dripping a little bit at that point. So I hope it'd be okay. Released it and like encouraged it to kind of fly up into the trees. So I'm like, great. Okay, the rest is in its hands or tarsi now. But the gods were watching and they laughed because on the way back, I thought, oh, well, I'll just have a look at the sassafras and just, you know, just to see. And I found three more. So anyway, yeah. So this 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 is this is my life now, apparently. You you are you're 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 deep in caterpillars. Yeah, but which is great because actually I haven't actually like really like documented in my journal a lot of these things yet. So I have but I have a lot of photos and a lot of like the notes that I'm gonna do. I have more opportunities to watch more of their life cycle in, in detail. So that's very this exciting. Is excellent. But yeah, so that was that was that was I was just going to show off that my, this is my, I, I got a little uh, ahead of myself and ahead of you. <laughs> and the moment the Walters pulled that out, I said, okay, this is my chance to practice my like 15 minute landscape veto instead of my two hour landscape veto, which is what yes. it's going to be. So I didn't take any of your advice because I did it before you gave the advice. Um, uh, getting to know a new paper because I finally used up the um, other sketchbook I was using for these that has really yucky paper that, well, it's fine for dry media but not wet i'm glad um, you're on the paper that makes you happy yeah well this is this is this is a new one for me and, and it's it's uh fun. it takes the watercolor a little better which is nice but i was actually quite pleased even though like i i took followed none of your advice because as i said i went went before that but I, I was thinking what i was really struck by with the uh, that scene with walters was the the sort of rich browns and green and colors just something that I've kind of struggled with because the only pine bush, especially this time of year, is starting to go these things. Beautiful, beautiful kind of, you know, like it's not quite gone to the, the reds and stuff yet, but it won't be long. And I, I don't really, I haven't really done any of this keeping in the pine bush because it's just hard. <laughs> so, and, and whenever I do greens, I always seem to just like pick a green from my palette and be afraid to mix anything with it. Yeah. And then I get like a very bright green, which is fine if you want a bright green, that's not what I want. So I was actually quite pleased that I sort of like picked, I took, took, a, I took a nice green and I, and I took some uh, burnt sienna and I, and I kind of put, I, I let them mix on the paper and that gave me some really nice, uh, 
sort of interesting mixes and things and I kind of went over that. Mixing on the paper often, mm -hmm. you, if you don't like it, you can't, and so it's, it's harder to change, but when it works, you get the, the colors will just play together in beautiful, beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I think, and really, I think for, for like what, what, I, what I've been kind of trying to do for a landscape veto is just to get a sense of the place and not worry too much about the exact details because getting the exact details is what makes me end up doing a two or three hour landscape veto. Yeah. Which is, which is great, except that if I were planning for that, I would have made it bigger. And also I want to like do some other nature. <laughs> so I, I want, I really want to like just practice doing it. Just, just quick, 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 you know, quick and dirty, you know, <laughs> to get on to things. So that was fun. And then I kind of was playing, I, I had uh, at some point got one of these, uh, wax pencils, which I used oh. to great effect a while back. Uh, it turns out I was a little too tentative with it here. So now I've learned something. So I was trying to get this sort of, you know, deeper clouds yep. and uh, it, it, in the end, it didn't do much on here. So now I know, now I know to, to press harder if I want more white on there. So yeah, all, all, all of those nice different shapes of clouds that get thinner as they get toward the horizon are all there. You just can't see them. So <laughs> So yeah, this is this is it's this is fun to to give it a try. This is this is uh, good. um, but yeah, I, I don't I, I don't realize that that folks want to sh want to want to share. I don't want to take too much time. I I was I had I had a more current thing to share, but it occurred to me because of uh, uh, Jack and Jack showing uh, those cool spiders. That I don't think I ever showed off this spider from back in June that I saw. Ooh. Oh, look exciting. at your topology too on the leaf <laughs> curve. <sighs> So I do have to say, technically, this is this is you know curvature is a uh, is, is 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 would would be the, sort of the opposite of a topological characteristic, even though in a weird roundabout way, negative curvature is something that is part of the topology that I study. So, but uh, you know, topography might be the the term. But oh. yeah, so I saw the spider, and I, I'm guessing it was an egg case, but I didn't see what was what mm -hmm. was actually inside there. So I don't know if they make little silk mats for other reasons but yeah it was laying down all this silk on this uh on this on this black locust leaf here and um i was actually watching it move around and sort of moving its butt back and forth and you know so there's oh, that's very so very cool yeah 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 little, i see what you're saying uh, yeah so this is very sort of like sort of little little lumps almost like velcro or something that the, the loop version of the velcro on the top there from from the uh um, the silk and it, and it was really it was like sort of there was a very definite pattern where it's sort of making its way around but it's also coming, coming through the middle sometimes and it's doing this like back and forth thing to lay down silk and it was interesting because I had been watching um, here's a sort of series of questions on this here but I, I had been had been watching earlier in the year I'd been watching some uh, uh, tent caterpillars which make communal webs um, you know themselves and they are making silk with their their mouths and since i did this i've been now watching my spice with swallowtail caterpillars boy the stuff they do with silk is pretty cool wait till you wait till i get that in my nature journal i'll show you if you amazing. oh i cannot wait i'm but, so yeah. excited this yeah. is but really I had, but I had a lot of, yeah so this was i actually this was I, I painted when i got home i had taken a taken a close photo of it and so i thought well let me try and get like a really nice sharp, sharp photo and the thing that i was very pleased about um with with this is that i I, I I got the sort of the, the translucency of the legs, I think. Yes. Not as colorful as those yeah. spiders, but uh, it was I really. I love those little kind of rim lights on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the fun thing is so I actually was noticing in the photo you could see how there was just a little bit you could like what makes the legs look translucent. You know, like when when you look at it, you're like you know you're like oh yeah it's it's translucent, but but it's hard to sort of go past that and be like okay but what makes it look translucent yes yes that's right so looking really closely i could see okay in the middle of the leg was where you can see a bit of green through it where it's against the leaf and where it's against the white silk you don't see the green through it but then around the edges what you're actually seeing is the more the color of the leg and the oh, yeah the so it helped to have a nice sharp photo of it to work from but it was um uh, yes yeah, so that was that was a lot of a lot of fun to try and that was an Eve is mentioning um, Tricia of Insectopia, which and this was just when I had started or seen a few of the Insectopia videos. And so I was like, you know, paying a lot of attention to the segments and things on there. But yeah. That is really fun. But I said, I, I, I didn't realize other folks want to also share, but I wanted to show off 
um, quickly. So I, um, a few weeks ago, I had gone to Florida. So I wasn't here for a week and a half or so. I went to visit my, my cousin in Florida. And so I thought, well, this is a good opportunity to, uh, you know, to see all the cool, uh, you know, Florida bugs, especially all the cool butterflies there are in Florida and everything. Jack, what have you done to me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah i actually for, for one thing i actually did not see and i didn't have much opportunity um, uh, because of what we were doing uh to like you know get out and look for bugs but the the just, just so happened during that visit the place where i had previously seen a lot of cool butterflies they've trimmed all the plants oh and so the butterflies weren't there this time but uh, but I thought I would do a little, little uh, diagram here of, of this. They're doing a bunch of construction now. They have all these waterways behind all the houses and things. Because, you know, it's basically at zero feet, you know. It's basically at sea level. So if it floods, there's got to be something to uh, to get that. So they're doing, well, so in this case, I don't think they were trimming it for no reason. I think it was because they were doing a lot of construction around there. But I have previously seen and was glad to see again all kinds of interesting birds. So, uh, yeah, I've got a... Um, a little blue heron does a cool little sort of like, you know, sort of like neck motion when it's. Is you know, that a limpkin? Yes. Oh my so, goodness! You found a limpkin. Oh my. Okay, okay so here's the, here's the this is the thing. Okay, so so my cousin and I we're gonna like go do some shopping trips, and this is this is kind of like like I she she's like kind of interested in going and seeing nature stuff, but. Um, also, also has some health issues and so you can't walk very far, but also just like, that was what she wanted to do is she wanted like, let's go to the bookstore. It's like, great, let's go to the bookstore. So I was driving her car. The problem is, is that I should not drive to Florida. Um, so I, I have, I have in the past, uh, once or twice driven in Florida from Tampa to where my, my, my cousin lives, which is further south. And you have to go across the, this like huge causeway that goes across Tampa Bay. And it's very, very dangerous. It's not because of the cars, like Florida, Florida drivers. I mean, honestly, our drivers here in New York are worse. It's the birds. It's every, every single light post has got like a different kind of cool bird sitting up there. And I'm driving along and I'm going, oh no. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, oh. I do the same thing. I, I, yeah, it's very bad. So don't I don't want to talk on the cell phone while driving, but <laughs> burning. Yeah. Oh, it's, um, it's so dangerous. Yeah, and there's just so many of them. The thing is, I, th I thought this would be safe because we're just driving like through town. We're just driving along the like, road through town to go to the bookstore. It's great, right? I'm looking at the side of the road. I'm like, there's this bird on the side. It's like in on the grass next to the sidewalk. Because there's just cool birds everywhere. And like, say what else you want to say about Florida. There's just so many cool birds. So, um, yeah. So, and there's this cool bird. And I, and I, and I had kind of glimpsed it for a minute. And then I forced myself to look back in front. And I said to my, my, my sister, I was like, did you see that bird? And she says, no, what? And I, said, I just, I started, I said, okay, the production effect. Because I can't stop the car. I'm just going to drive while saying what I saw. And I was able to sort of like dictate Okay, it was tall, it was kind of crane shaped, but it was brown, but it had these white flecks. It had a long bill, I think it was kind of down curved. And, you know, it was like standing there, you know, it did not have the kink in the neck the way a heron does. And then, and then, so then, so then we, we stop, we get to, the, to the, the bookstore. Very first thing I do is I sort of draw like the quickest little sketch that I can in here of it. Uh, and then in the bookstore, I go straight to the nature section go find a florida field guide and i, I thought it might, i was thinking limpkin and i'm like but do i think it's a limpkin I, I, I was like i don't know why that name popped into my head but apparently i've been studying the field guide enough to be able to tell that Isn't yeah that weird how something is just like you've never okay. seen this thing before but it's just on a neuron there like maybe limpkin exactly yeah i think well i've been i've been perusing i had been studying my my sibley prior to going but yeah so so you know i didn't really get enough you know, like a lot of enough detail to really be sure, except that apparently this is the only bird that looks basically like that, at least certainly in this area. So that's what it had to be. So yeah. And then I thought I would take your your idea of, of having your little your little um what is it mork that's uh, yeah, yeah mork mork yeah, so, oh, little... yeah well this guy this 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 is um Kevin the corner blue who has previously added some commentary to my pages. Because when I was catching him back in May, he decided to land on my, my paper and do a little critique of his portrait. So 
uh, now he's decided to come with me and uh, tell me that's about right. The George Walter Atkins. Yeah. Oh, that is so sweet. Yeah, the idea, of, the, the little you know critter icon. So oh, my, my my daughters are now they're they're telling me that they want. Um, now that Morp is in my um, has made a, a a strong appearance in my nature journal, they want me now also to add in um, axolotls and fruit bats um, into um, the keynote speech that I'm going to give for a Wild Wonder. <laughs> So they, they want they want axolotl photo bombs and uh, um, now and uh, and and now uh, Morp is going to be in there too uh, thanks to Avea. So <laughs> that's excellent. This is Kevin's first appearance, by the way. This was uh, um, when I when I was holding him on my finger and trying to sketch him. And I think you've seen this, but you haven't seen the the tail of his uh, little critiques there. Um, oh, he was he was being very critical so... of the portrait and uh, you know very skeptical, but I but I convinced him to just uh, kind of chill out and I think for some more. So <laughs> that is so much fun. That is so much fun. Yeah, that so that's I great. That. And I you, you named your fun. butterfly Kevin. Yeah, Kevin the corner blue. Kevin the corner blue, of course. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I'll, That's I'll, I'll last a little bit here because also this was the, the next day we went to the beach and so uh, my cousin was like, let's go in the water. And I'm like, let's look at birds. And then we had to compromise, but uh, no. Yeah, birds is <laughs> so, a slippery uh, slope. That's really fun. Yeah, so it was pretty awesome. I still have no idea what these little sandpipers were. I've been looking at field guides and the thing is, is that I didn't get enough detail to be able to identify them, but I got to watch them, so that was fun. <laughs> so. <laughs> this is great. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I love all that. So trying to get long wings and everything and the, the gulls has been uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that was really, really fun. And we got to meet Kevin. Yes. Yeah. So hopefully he'll make more appearances. We'll see. Yes, Depends if he has some right. you know, important stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah Morp, Morp is now a solid player in my nature journal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was really fun. Uh, again, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, let's join Sydney and see what's uh, what's up in your book. Hey there, and you may now unmute. Hello. Hello. Um, I found I, I have a very bad habit of finding things that I want in Nature Journal and not journaling them for like a week and then I finally get around to doing it and then they've changed um but luckily this one didn't change too much um it was these cool plants that I found that have the thing that interested me the most is these um really cool shaped uh bases of the seed pods but I didn't know that's what they were until I nature journaled which is why we do this <laughs> yeah. um but yeah they there's this tri-symmetrical uh seed pod that grows wait where's the little baby one okay grows from this little um pyramid and then it gets fatter and then it dries out and then the somehow like the top section here pops off and it makes the it leaves behind this base that dries out and turns brown and it's this really cool shape and i yeah oh. i love it Wow, no, that's really fun. I love the geometry in that. Yeah. That's really very, cool. Yeah, when when you um when when you when you take a look at um you know the, in, in, so everybody gets into uh the flowers, right? But there's and when they're not in bloom, there's nothing to draw um but seed pods have such cool geometry and just you know, the sometimes the structure function relationship of them is also you can figure these things out that's really cool yeah and actually that was one of my questions was i there were no flowers on and on any of the plants along the road that i was um sketching on this was the youngest that I could find, and it, it seems to have the remnant of maybe some sort of pollinating function, and that was present on all stages, um, but I didn't see a flower, so I thought that was very interesting. 
And it, it's also what's neat about something like this is that this question will then eat at you and eat at you and eat at you. And next spring, until next year, whenever I can see if there's exactly. flowers. Exactly. <laughs> no, but but if you didn't journal about it, that yeah. question wouldn't linger in the same way. So next year, when you're walking along that stretch of the road, you'd be like, "Oh, this is the region. This is the region," and you're going to be yeah. getting in there and, you know, opening up a flower and looking at the shape of its ovary, and you're like, "Oh, you're in three parts." Yes, yes, All right. And uh, it's it's so much fun to have because there's 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 several different types of questions. There's the questions that you can answer from your own direct observations, and it's so neat to kind of like, you know, what is this thing? And then we can go out and figure that out. Like what is making that noise? We can go figure that stuff out by our direct observations. That's really cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then I am doing uh, Marley Piper's 30 day challenge. And here's another example of something I found a long time ago and didn't nature journal until it had already changed. I found these mushrooms um, when we first started our rainy season, um, it's rained here every day, almost every day, which is incredible because we were in a very bad drought before that. <laughs> um, but they uh, we could use a little bit of that down here. Green coating, um, which was interesting. Um, also, I'm going to put my Instagram in the chat. I am sharing every day the pages that I'm doing for each prompt. And um, on my stories, I'm writing out my ideas for the day. Um, so if you're feeling lost for what to do for your prompts, you could maybe, uh, steal one of my ideas <laughs> that I'm not that's, using. That's so. really cool. Um, we, we also, um, as once you put it in there, the, uh, also tell us what your Instagram, uh, uh, is this is at rocking underscore zebra. Yes. And I am cool private, handle. but anyone who tries to follow me today, I'll accept because I'll know that ah, I sent you. <laughs> okay. All right, um, at rockin underscore zebra, um, rockin underscore zebra. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's <laughs> yeah, really cool. That's no problem. really, really cool, Sydney. Um, um, there's one more that I wanted to share just because I'm very proud of myself because I'm not an artist, but through nature journaling, I actually enjoy the things that I draw, which is a new experience for me. Usually I have an idea in my mind and I can't make it work, but I don't have an idea in my mind. I have observations in my mind and I translate them to paper, which is really fun, but here's a cactus that I drew, and I'm so proud of it. <laughs> oh, see, the you know, isn't it interesting how we label ourselves? Like, I'm not yeah, an artist. I'm not an artist, but, uh, but look, but look what I made. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm not an artist. I'm just the person who makes art. Yeah. So, right. so, um, if you sort of think about, you know, are you going to have? Um, artist be a noun or a, or a verb, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if we don't, um, you know, you, you, you start arting enough, you might be an ist, but sometimes the, 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 the ist label, um, you know, you, people think like you have to start wearing a beret and hanging out in cafes <laughs> and all this sort of stuff. No, you, you are what you do and this is what you do. And so if you want to, uh, you may give yourself, I, 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 I grant you license to use that title if you, <laughs> if it, if it feels comfortable with you, if it feels like it's pressure, then just let it go. But you are doing art. You are Thank doing you. art and you're doing the kind of art that makes you think you're doing the kind of art that makes you observe. And, um, that's wonderful. That's Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, Strong I came, I came to nature journaling because I want to be a scientist and I'm on my way there and I'm, and I, and I have allowed myself to take on that title. Like I am a scientist because I decided to. Um, and so the art of through, through nature journaling and the art of nature journaling, I, that, that is where I found like, here is my science. And, uh, yeah, it's been really <laughs> powerful for me because I, yeah. I get just... to be a scientist right now. Not no, hold, hold, hold yeah. that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah. You, you know, scientist is, is about the way that you think and looking at evidence and, and, uh, how do you kind of, uh, nurture the humility and curiosity that goes along with that? That is wonderful. And nature journaling is the most powerful way to do that. Could we see that cactus one more time? Of course. All right. So, 
I mean, uh, I just there's so much going on here that I find so exciting and interesting. Like the the, the shapes of these straps of these um, of the different sections of this, and then you have the shapes of the different kinds of spines on those. Mm -hmm. And then it's really cool to see how you've observed how they're in rows. And you're, you're looking at the structure. This is, there's just so much exciting observation and visualization and thinking. You know, just being able to make that little diagram on the side where the lines wrap around it. I mean, that is, that takes, you, you have to be able to see it and understand it, let it in, really absorb it to be able to then put it back out on the table. That's wonderful visualization. Thank you. Ah, oh, thank you, Sydney. Yeah, of course. All right, that's really fun. Um, let's join. Um, let's join Gina, and then we're going to be joining our friend Ray Bonto. Um, Gina, you may unmute, and you are now in the spotlight. Great to see you again. Hi, Jack. Good to see you again too. Um, before I continue, though, I do. We have lost our contact with you. We've lost our feed. We've cut out here. Before I continue with you, you said, I do. And then we lost everything after that. So uh, Gina, if you're, uh, we're going to keep you uh, in the, the, the queue here. Uh, your screen is frozen and we cannot hear your audio. Oh, there you are. You're back. Sorry, sorry. My hotspot went out for a moment. Okay. So. Um... I definitely saw Ray Bonto's hand up first. Oh, I don't know great. why it got uh, switched. I don't know, but uh, Ray Bonto definitely had his hand up first. So oh, if you well, would like to go first. Gina, thank you so much for, for tracking that for us. Let's bump no. over to Ray Bonto, and then we're going to join our friend uh, Gina in Israel. So first to London. Um, it's our friend Ray Bonto. And Ray Bonto, you may unmute. Oops, we'll try that one more time. Um, I think that was the, uh, Ray Bonto, use the raise hand function again, and then we'll see you. Um, I think his internet might have uh, dropped him by accident, so hopefully. Oh dear. Well, if Ray Bonto returns, we'll, we'll join him then. Meanwhile, Gina, uh, you may now, uh, unmute again. And thank you so much for looking out for all our friends here. Uh, oh. <laughs> Excellent. You're back. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know what happened to Ray Bonto. Oh, oh we'll, um, we'll, join, we'll, we'll, we'll just bounce over to you and then uh, we'll join Ray Bonto after that. Okay, cool. So um, last week, I went on my bird quiz, my shorebird quiz with my friend. I want to hear how this went. Okay. And so um, I don't know if I shared that I did a whole bunch of like uh, studying the birds before I went to prepare for the quiz. And um, I was so expecting myself to like get one or two right out of the 10 species that would be there. But Wow, just studying the birds, like drawing the birds beforehand, looking at photos on the internet like this, it actually really, really helped. Like, since I needed to copy them down on paper, it made me look at them more than for like the 20 seconds you'd see them outside far away. And yeah. I was actually real surprised. I got a lot of them right. And it was so surprising that now my eye had become a little trained I could see the big differences between the shorebird um, species, ones that beforehand I had always been like, I've been so overwhelmed, like so many species and they all look so similar. Um, I had always been overwhelmed and I had never been able to quite grasp them. But this time I buckled down and I studied the species that uh, I knew that were common. And this time I was able to identify them 
a lot of the ones that I studied, I identified them almost right away. Like, ah, oh, I saw that one yesterday for, I studied that one for like an hour. I studied oh, that one. This is great. Minutes. It was amazing. It felt, it felt amazing. Like that I, be, like I had gone bird watching for like the past five years, but every time when it came to shorebirds, I always like held my hands up in yeah. surrender. Yeah. Like yeah. I can't do this. And they're brown. I, they have beaks and long legs and there's a lot of them. Exactly. And so, but this time I, I was able to see the differences, the difference in plumage, the difference in size, the different light color and um, not taking my camera, but instead taking my, um, my journal was so helpful because the man who took me, my friend who took me bird watching, he would give me more tips on how to identify them. And I was able to write <laughs> them down, like all the 15 things that he told me. And it was we, amazing. We'd love to see some of these pages. Is that? I mean, we... Of course. And so this first page is like my first time drawing shorebirds outdoors. So it's a little hesitant. Um, also, one thing I noticed is that um, I was outside and it was a windy day. So every time I tried to draw on this page, the, bird, the, <laughs> the pages would go. Yeah, and it yeah. wouldn't let me draw properly. So I can't, I, when I got home, I was like, okay, I need a paper clip from now on. Nice, so. good move. And what was really cool is that, um, so like I drew these, I drew like, this was a redneck oh, look at this, this cool back view. They're amazing. And like, they have this really cool, like a uh, like black mohawk stripe down their neck. And apparently they uh, they like spin in circles in the water to stir up mos mosquito larvae, and then they eat those. And and um, phalaropes are one of the only one of the very few bird species in which the female is um, polygamous, like goes around mating with a whole bunch of males, and the males raise the um, incubate the eggs and raise the chicks and do all of the work. And, and the female just goes around and like mates and lays eggs. And and what is interesting about the plumage of male and female phalaropes? Yes. Um, so the females in phalaropes, females do all the mating. They they battle that out for mates, and they are the much more colorful sex. The males are rather more drab, which is really interesting and very uncommon in the bird world. And also the, uh, the my friend who took me bird quizzing, <laughs> he was actually a hired employee at a bird um, sanctuary here in Israel. So he really knows his birds. Yeah. And uh, he saw the phalarope walking on the shore and he was like, that's really strange. And I, and I thought, what's so strange about seeing a shorebird walk on the shore? Yeah. And he said, I have never seen them walk on land. They're always walking in water or swimming. I have never seen them on land. And that was really interesting too. That's yeah. so, so much I, fun. It was amazing. So I got to write it down that um that uh, they they're always in water. And what was even cooler is since I live in Israel, we have pretty cool species of not only birds but also mammals. So what we saw was, we saw an Egyptian mongoose. Look at these little socks. Oh. Yeah. They had very nice, dainty feet. And this was actually a mother mongoose. And she had two little cubs trailing behind her. Oh. They were amazing. And they passed right in front of us, like a meter and a half away from us. And... And like they were very silent, you know. They they're they're hunters. They're they're very amazing hunters, and they had like this little. <laughs> and um, their face was rather a bit black, and they had like these really cool stripes. And you could definitely see that they had a very, very coarse, um, overcoat. Like their their mm -hmm. their fur was like, really long, and like it reached oh, your, down. Your observations are so are so specific and rich here this is great thank you they were they were amazing to see and it was it was just so cool to see this not this predator this animal who was that was built for hunting that was built for predation like 
um, after seeing like hours and hours and hours of bird to see, to look face to face with a predatory animal, the vibe is completely different, the feeling is completely different. And you can just see how their build and their bodies are just so specifically engineered to fit their needs. And it was just such a stark contrast. Very, very, very cool. This is this is this is wonderful, Gina. And and what a, an interesting um, set of observations that you know you you gave yourself. You thought you'd have a lot longer before your your test day, but your test day was like you, your your friend said next week, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you had one week to learn the shorebirds, and you chose to do that by making a whole bunch of drawings. Mm -hmm and 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 observing with a pencil in your hand and you got out there and you your brain now you know there, there's little subtle differences like what is the angle of your forehead and the proportions and these sorts of things at the start this is overwhelming to get but if we draw it we make ourselves sort of see all those sorts of characteristics that are actually the things that the high end, like really master birders are also observing. They they're observing proportion. So if if you're out there and there's a bird and it's just in silhouette, they'd be able to say like, oh yeah, that's a fowl rope. Yeah, that's a godway. Um, and you know how do you know it's black? It's backlit. Well, just you know its shape, its proportion, the way that it's walking, these sorts of things. That's what also we notice as journalers. Gina, that's wonderful. Thank you. And it was even more helpful because now, like, I write down the species that I've studied. It narrows down the scope of the birds that I haven't studied. And so, mm -hmm. of course, in the field, we did see several species that I hadn't gotten around to studying. And and those, I could go, like, we had the field scope set up, and I would be just, like, flipping through my journals, like, oh, I, I, I think I saw that one yesterday. I think I, um, is it a little stint? And then he would say, yes. And I'd do like this little dance of happiness. But I, <laughs> I always did oh. the film. I always did. <laughs> oh, see. And, um, and um, also when I saw some, and also I would know for sure which birds were the ones that I didn't study because I would recognize none of their features. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I, I would honestly admit I didn't get to study that one. I don't know who this is. And then my friend would give me a hint, like, um, I'll give you a hint. And this bird, the males are much bigger than the females. And the males have a big um, collar, a big fluffy mm -hmm. collar. And I was like, oh. This is, is a really it, rough day. Is it a rough? Yes, we get roughs here in the winter. And um, we don't get the nice breeding plumage ones, but, um, but uh, we still do get them. Oh, and this is then, so cool. Yeah, and then I'd see like, okay, I can see how it's very, very different from any of the birds I studied yesterday. And that would just tell me like, uh, like break it down into little pieces, more more pieces that are easier to handle, like and narrow down the um, the things that I need to study. And and so also when you're doing the those sketches of the birds, even if you're not looking at the same, all the species that you're going to be seeing, you're training yourself how to see shorebirds. Exactly. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Like, I wish I'd started this like two years ago. It's, this is this is so good. We all start just wherever we are. And you know, very often people say like, well, because I didn't start two years ago, it's too late for me to start. But you can just wherever you are, just start, just start. And then everything from here on out, um, things happen, patterns emerge. That's wonderful. And that's absolutely true. And I, I asked my friend, like, hey, uh, do you mind if we do this like once or twice, like once every week or so? And he's like, yeah, sure, shoot. And so now I'm pestering him like, hey, hey, let's go again. Let's go again. Let's go again. Gina, yeah, this is this is wonderful. This oh, this practice. Um, you know, when, when my when my daughters practice violin, something that we're pointing out to them is that in addition to learning how to play the violin, you're learning how to practice. Mm -hmm. You're learning how to how to pay attention, how to focus. And um, this this kind of 
work, this approach really, really does that. You're kind of laying in neural tracks that then allow your brain to look at something, receive that information and get it down on paper. I find it so much, it's so helpful for me to study a little bit about, you know, the structure of shorebirds. Then I go out there and I see a shorebird and I understand, uh, you know, how these patterns are fitting together. Otherwise, there's just, there's a whole bunch of brown and stripy and leggy and long billy going on. And this allows your brain to make sense of that, to make structure of that. You know, this is really exciting. Thank you. And uh, I have a, I have one more page that I found. Great. Here. Let's, let's, I'm going to make you big screen. Okay. And boom, big Gina, there you go. So, so we went birding in the afternoon. So at around like five. And so the sun started to set at around seven and it slowly started to become too dark. So the birds stopped move, moving and it also started to become a little bit difficult to see and identify the birds clearly. So we were like, okay, um, let's pack up and start heading home. And on our way out of the, um, of the area, he, my friend stops driving and he looks at the spider webs that are outside of his car. And he was like, I've never seen this sort of spider web in this area before. And I asked like, can I get out of the car to see it? And he's like, yeah, you only live once, go for it. <laughs> and uh, so I whip out my notebook and my pencil again. And uh, this was really interesting. I really liked this experience because I I do have arachnophobia, a fear of spiders. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I also respect them because I know the amazing things they um, they do for the environment, and I love the structure of their webs. And um, so I try to document. I tried to document how like the spider webs were like covering the bushes like gossamer curtains uh -huh. but i had no idea how to draw that and it was it was it was not it's not putting myself down it was a self experience it's a self observation like okay i'm not familiar with knowing how to draw with these things okay yeah, cool yeah yeah that down the line sometime um first of all not very good at drawing trees and bushes second of all not good at drawing spider webs so it was um uh, yeah 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 but, uh, I wrote it down, and uh, also, it's like there were like these little cotton balls everywhere, and I don't know what these were. Like Ivea, do you, do you think you know what these were? Maybe like they had like cotton balls everywhere, and they were like it was it was almost as if they were like the egret version of spiders. They were like all nesting in, like a communal like over a couple of trees. They, they yeah, I'm wondering egg sacs, but they were like really fluffy cotton ball. They didn't really look like those nice cocoony things. Um, but uh, also this, I tried to document the spiders and it also, again, it pointed out to me that, okay, I'm really familiar. I'm very good at drawing birds. They come naturally to me now, but uh, spiders are still very awkward to me. I should get down to studying them one day and like... Uh -oh. Art is also like an exercise. If you're used to drawing them, your your hand kind of goes on autopilot and sled, kind of goes on autopilot and draws it very much more naturally if you're used to the shape. And um, some there are two species. One were like these like really big like mushroom mushroom butt like mushroom button butt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's another one that was like red brown brick colored, and these were like would like stretch out to like disguise themselves if we like touch the 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 webs and they were shocked and they were surprised and they would like stretch out and they would hide like that. But then when they were relaxed, they'd walk around like that. And they had like really long bodies. <clears throat> oh you know, I, I, it's so cool that you're you're embracing something that makes you feel uncomfortable. And instead of running away from that, yeah, leaning I into to, that. Yeah, you know. and not used to drawing that. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's great. And then there's, there's, then there's a whole world that opens up there. I remember I, I took a class on spiders up at the Sierra Nevada field campus here in uh, California. Mm -hmm. And after that class, I was just walking around in the forest and I've seen spider webs everywhere. And all these questions about spiders, and of course, 
those spiders have always been all around me. Um, and I, I just suddenly realized like, I just, this has been happening all my life. And, but I've never seen it. I, it's like, I, when you kind of start spider geeking out, all of a sudden, there's spiders and they're they're doing all these neat things and they and then they're they'll just like birds you can watch their behaviors yeah. um I was watching you know you know what what do they do with their little legs when they kind of get to the you know, like they're like why are you shaking your weight web like that you know and and why are you kind of and sometimes it seems like they'll, they'll be like plucking their webs like little harps and they're just up to all sorts of crazy spider business and if we give ourselves permission to watch them i mean the 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 mystery un, unfolds in front of us so they're all they're they're a really cooperative group of organisms um close focus binoculars are awesome with spiders very cool yeah because then then you get to sort of see their little behaviors um without you know, you, you can be this far from them and they're not scared of you, but then you put the close focus binoculars up and they're like, there's a big old spider there and you can watch all its business. That's fine. Very cool. Gina. Do you, have a, do you have a video out on how to draw spiders or? There is one, but it is not, it's okay. It's useful, but um, what I want to do is really understand spider leg positions in a different way that I can make some generalizations that will help me draw those leg poses from different angles. Because um, mm -hmm. there are different postures you know, that I, I really didn't get this before. And if you go through my field guide about the Sierra Nevada spiders, I mean the Sierra Nevada uh, critters, the spiders in there, those drawings are okay, but they're not... They don't really, I don't really capture the postures of these things mm -hmm. the way I would like to. So I want to, um, something that is in my future is, is, a, is a spider deep dive. Nice. And um, we will, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get some workshops up specifically about that. That'd be After very Wild cool. Wonder. After Wild Wonder. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, um, that too, and like just one more thing, like Sydney mentioned that um, like you you don't like you know like not considering themselves as an artist, etc. And uh, I went through that exact same thing. Whenever I introduced myself, I would say I'm studying, I'm studying birds. I'm not yet, I'm not very good. Um, I'm studying, I'm still learning how to draw. I'm not very good. Um, Etc. I would always identify myself and I would always introduce myself as somebody who's still on the learning process and not there yet. But also in some ways, it kind of served as my own um, excuse to like not not try harder. Sometimes a lot of times, actually, for, for me personally. Um, so like, for example, like the shorebirds, like I was like, oh, I'm not still I'm still not like other people have had 20 years of experience. I've only had five. Like, I don't have to be that good yet. Um, and that and then like, I think like three weeks ago, I, I was like, you know what? No, I. I, I am an artist. I draw and like I, I observe and I put it down on paper. I am an artist. I am an ornithologist. I am a scientist. Um, and I should change that. And um, I'm a bird watcher. So that's what I do. I go bird watching. I'm an artist. So that's what I do. I draw. I'm not waiting. I'm not going to wait for somebody to come and hand me a business card. Say, congratulations, you're an artist. <laughs> like, like, then, and then you get the beret. And then the palette and then the easel exactly. and uh, I decided to yeah I'm not like I decided to no longer wait to give myself permission to call myself something and um, also that got rid of that almost instantly got rid of all the excuses I, I had been hiding behind Ooh, that is really powerful mm -hmm. say that one more time that is um that is really a rich thought yeah, I I um I decided to stop waiting for other people to give me permission, and that also got rid of all the excuses that I had been hiding behind.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jack, for giving me a chance to share. That, that, that's a full binocular and brush drop right there. Sorry? I said that, that's a binocular or brush drop right there, right? Instead of a mic drop, it's the, <laughs> the uh, that's a binocular drop, which isn't actually very good. There you go. It's a little bit better to do it with the brush. It's not really good for our optics when we do the binocular drop, but yeah, binocular drop, brush drop. You <laughs> and, are, yeah, sorry. No, uh, thank you, Jack, so much for giving us an opportunity every single week to share with everybody. It's it's such an honor every single time. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And And isn't it amazing how much we learn from each other's insights? Just listening to you think about that, Gina, has really crystallized a bunch of wonderful thoughts in my head, and I'm going to have a lot to kind of ruminate on. And uh, that's really, really powerful transformation right there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, just let, let that thought sink in and see where it goes. Um, let's, um, if I think Ray Bonto may have had to bounce. Oh, no, right there. Um, Ray Bonto. Um, it is good to have you with us, um, and um, you can, um, let's see, um, why am I not allowed, to, okay, you, uh, Ray Bonto, you may, un, I think you are unmuted, and uh, if you want to turn on your camera, you may. Ray Bonto might be having some internet troubles. Um, oh, I'm, Ray Bonto, I'm so, sorry that we uh, um, are having a hard time kind of getting through to your signal. Ah, uh, yeah, just disappeared again. Whew. Uh, well, Ray Bonto is coming to join us. I see Avea's looking through her journal, which makes me think that there's something that happened that made her, uh, that you, uh, you know, perhaps went down a rabbit hole, or there's an insight that you would be willing to share. Is that so? Right. I'm going to bring on the mad botanist herself. If you had some interesting uh, discussions and, and thoughts this, uh, this share here, haven't we? They've been wonderful. I'm really looking forward to rewatching the recording so that I can like, maybe I'll even practice sketch noting by looking through this again. That's something that I kind of am trying to grow. So it'd be really fun too. But just like when we, when we journal together, we get all these ideas from other people's pages. And when we have these conversations, we have little opportunities to kind of get into each other's minds and mine those ideas. There's some really, really rich thoughts here. They really do. Oh, I'm a little sad I can't find the thing I wanted to show. I decided just for sort of funsies to draw um, to draw my inner um, my inner critic. So that, that way I can do some practicing of um, diffusing what the inner critic has to say. I cannot find <clears throat> my inner critic drawing. So in the meantime, I'll just entertain you with a goose revealing its true form. <laughs> um, it was supposed to be just doing shadow work before I get around to filling in the details because this is one of the birds that appears at my restoration site. Mm -hmm. But just doing the shadow, it made the goose feel so ominous. And that just captures the personality so well. <laughs> oh, this is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> this goose is definitely the boss. <laughs> the goose is, yeah, it just, and, you don't mess Isn't it, it neat how just a simple shadow shape um, with a crisp edge? You know, you can you now can visualize the planes on the side of this goose. Yeah. So yeah, just just the simplest way to think about shadows is just that there is there's a light area and there's a dark area, and you just draw on the terminator and make one dark, one light, and you're done. And if you really pay attention to the shape of that terminator, you will get the volume of the bird. Oh, let's see where your birds are going. This is fun. 
Um, this one is a really difficult angle that I'm going to have to try again because I have a hard time getting the tail when the tail's staring straight on at you. So I was trying yeah. to see if the shadows would help me, but that was challenging. Um, and then <clears throat> I finally managed to get kind of the subtle feathers instead of going crazy like I usually do and overdoing it and making it look like a pine cone, as we say. Um, and then this one I still haven't painted because I like it too much right now. Um, oh, that, that is fun. It's yeah. what it's trying to do is in that stage is before it gets the rest of its color on it, it says, I'm a lilac breasted roller. No, really, I'm a lilac breasted roller. That's on my list of things that I need to finish because I, I drew one, but I just haven't colored it in yet. So yeah, that'd be fun. I could have like a bird off with the two of them together. <laughs> Let me see. This here. iridescence is really coming out strong. That was that was that was fun. That was rewatching your um, class. I'm trying to see if there's anything else new that I've been doing. You've Not been really. doing a ton of stuff. You're on bug days. Yeah. Um. This was in the field, quick sketching this during a break um, in the action, and I was proud of myself that it took me under five minutes to sketch these two things. Um, because I'm trying to get better at sketching fast in the field, and then sat down and tried to sketch a little landscape piece though. And it was challenging, but I was like, whatever, I'll just do it again some other time. Um, just that that way I have kind of a before and after. This is a place that I like to call Domino Hill because I fall a lot on this hill. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there's, and there's all of, there were, there were past tense, all of these poison hemlocks and radishes um, all over the hill, but not anymore. So that's been kind of- Oh, uh, you can get primeval on this. Oh, now, I did it. And, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting. It's not too long ago that drawings. Um, oh, is this, is this the critic here? Yeah, I'm planning to make an entire series, like I'm planning to make an entire article um, where, oh, like on Marley's thing wow. about what kind of things we say to ourselves, especially with art. And then I'm going to create a second version of myself snarking back at the inner critic. So that, that way people can just sort of practice seeing their inner critic as a troll. I mean, is, that's what the inner critic is. The inner it's, critic is a troll. We're trolling not, ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, yes. and then if you are crazy like me and you listen enough to the you've been trolled song, then, um, then after a while you begin to hear that every time your inner critic shows up and then the inner critic doesn't seem so scary anymore once you begin hearing that in your head, so. Yeah. If anybody hasn't, it's wow. it's sung to the tune of Be Our Guest, and it's called You've Been Trolled, and it's hilarious, and I'd sing it, but I don't want to kill your eardrums. That is so good. <laughs> oh, man. That, that's, why did I never realize that the inner critic was the troll? It's yep. your, your brain is trolling itself. That is so good. Yeah, that is so good. You know, and that that you know that the the function of the troll is try to kind of tamp other people down, and in the same way that you're, um, you know, try to pull you back into the pot with it, and and we do it to ourselves. Wow, that's great. That's great. Now it just it was just a very short period of time ago that your troll was louder than the voice in you that said, I can. Yeah. And you worked through that. Was it the, was it that kind of that bird project? What was it that for you kind of tipped the balance where you, you, you're now all in and allowed you just to kind of keep moving forward past those voices? I wanna say, at first it was at first it was sheer anger anger at the inner critic inner anger at all of the voices that used to tell me that I couldn't um and I've always been afraid of feeling anger and so just letting myself be angry at all of the things that say you're not allowed to do this you can't do this you're bad at this helped me um because anger makes me more active um and so the you know the Voices would say the one thing, and I'd be like, "Them fighting words," and I'd be drawing anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after a while, kind of allowing the sorrow behind all of it. And once I began like feeling those things, then I began to just embrace the joy 
that I feel every time I start to draw a bird. And there's always that feeling at the beginning of fear um, of, of, you know, messing up. But then once the bird begins to come, I fall in love with the bird itself as I'm drawing it. And, um, and then falling in love with the challenge over and over again of trying to draw something that I'm shaky about uh, and, and noticing when I have something not quite right and then trying to get the right shape and not being able to, but then thinking it'd be fun if I could just zoom in and practice drawing this a few dozen times. And so maybe that's, does that explain somewhat of what I. Oh, it does. It does. It does. Um, yeah, just. Uh, Sarah just typed in inner critic, uh, fear, anger, sorrow, love, and you know, you're mindful of your own processes and inner conversation to the degree that you can see what it is and, and start to change some of those narratives. A lot of folks are just stuck in uh, you know, not, you know, not wanting to explore those feelings, because it's, it's scary to kind of, you know, put some marks down on paper and kind of go like, you know, that doesn't look like my duck. Um, and just sort of makes me think about, you know, the, the work of, if there are, you know, personal things that are, are, are holding you back, doing the work, doing the therapy, doing the, the journaling to get that out of here where we kind of go like, ah, yeah. Doing the vent writing in like, oh no, I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, I'm alive. Good, Doing good. There's this little earthquake over there in San Francisco. Yes, exactly. And I've got something like, maybe this is maybe my ninth one since the pandemic began, rant journals. That's Just journals full of rants and ideas and just everything, everything, letting it all come out and, and feeling it. You That's know? really, really, and, and feeling it. Because you can't heal what you, you can't heal what you don't feel. I remember mm -hmm. hearing that from somebody. So um, that helps. And, and just, I, I sort of have the same reaction towards, I, I was sort of grew up thinking like, you know, anger, anger is bad because in my brain, I associated anger with violence. And those two are totally different things, you know, anger, a, a, a just wrath can be a very motivating thing that's different than, and, and it's, and it's a, a totally different beast. Um, oh, Gina says anger is love in motion. And that's powerful. And, but, but again, really different than, than violence and, um, being able to make that distinction and to be angry and to feel that it's that's really powerful the uh but again getting it out of your head and into those journals so critical for moving our our our, our brain out of that just sort of rumination that we get into we can just spin our wheels and kind of be like i have no idea what's going on in my brain <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Right. Um, there was another thing that helped me too yes. that I don't want to overlook and that I'm especially thankful for. And that's you allowed me to share my journals with you. And I felt very seen when you did. And so I felt like you could see that I was, you know, trying to get what I was trying to do and where I was struggling. And so that helped me so much feeling seen by you in that. And then there have been other times where my journals haven't been so much about drawing really well, but have been just ideas that I'm trying to word vomit. And one of my friends told me that he can see my intention on my pages. And so knowing that I can be seen really mm. goes a long way too. Um, so thank you for that. I don't want to ever discount how much support means to me. Thank you. Let's think about how we can be that kind of support to each other. Yeah. The idea of, and, and Avea, we do see you and we respect you and we, we honor you as, as, as a core part of this, this community. And we're really grateful to what you've been doing. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you, all of you. <sighs> Thank you.
No, I saw for a moment there we got Ray Bonto back, but I don't see Ray Bonto now. Yeah. Ah. Um. So. Um, I'm going to bop over to my gallery view so I can see the faces of everybody who's still here. Oh, there's just a little cluster of us. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I hope that you uh, can take something really useful out of, out of today and out of our, our conversation. I'm really grateful for the people who are we're sort of sharing um, any thoughts, comments, or ideas either in the chat or or here on the, the screen with us. There's just so much deep, deep wisdom here. And I'm really honored to be part of this community that we're building. As, as, Avea, as you were saying, it is um, feeling seen and connected such an important part of being a human being is our um, is our our connections and relationships. And um, oh, Ray Bonto is back, so we're going to end with that. Ray Bonto is in the house. Hey, and we're going to add you into the spotlight. Ray Bonto is here, and you can unmute now. Hey, sorry for making you wait so long. <laughs> um, I have a very bad internet connection, so I might just drop off any moment, so I'll try to be quick. Okay. Um, um, you know the doodles just, um, yeah, he was the... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Again, uh, the, that value range, everybody just look at how punching in that dark value in that little bit of that front area there, gives that quick sketch a, a sense of um, gives that quick quick sketch a, a, a sense of of depth yeah so um, there's the Rubik's yeah. cubes that you juggle <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just can't help it um, <laughs> so I did some lightning and there's no need to film. Another time. Oh, oh, so we see the light and there's the, the, the dark outside the window. All of a sudden there's the flash and then we've got the rumble a few seconds later. Yeah. Oh. And it lasted for like 15 seconds and it's really loud. Yes, that was uh, three miles away from you. Oh, really? Yeah. So if uh, it'd be good to figure out what the calculation is for metric, but with uh, with miles, you take the you count the seconds between the flash and the rumble and divide by five and you can get a ballpark of the miles that that was away. It's just so cool to think about kind of light moving at one speed and sound moving at a speed that's slower. So the further away it is, the more separated those two events are going to be. But because those are predictable speeds, um, hold on, my phone in my pocket is making noise. I gotta get it out of there, silence you, silence, no, quiet, there, it's gone. All right, um, the, uh, yeah, you can, you can get a, um, <clears throat> you can get a, a sense of the, the, the time. But also look at, you know, thinking about kind of drawing a process in here, the dark window, the light window, the area that using words. Let me invent. It ah. was that, um, yeah, no, actually it, it, the gap was in 15 seconds. The rumble lasted for 15 seconds. Oh, whoa, so it's an immediate rumble. No. I don't know how much. Okay. But, okay, I've got it now. Oh, that lasts for 15 seconds. I just need to learn to read. <laughs> um, actually, what I notice is that in one flash, there's actually a giant flash and then a smaller flash after that immediately. It's there's like two in one. 
Yeah, my, my understand that there is a there's sort of two strokes in a lightning bolt. There is first this one little thin connector that that kind of completes the circuit, and then the, the rest of the energy just drives down that pipe. So at first there is, and is it like the first one comes, I, I remember hearing this somewhere, but I don't know if it's true, that the first one comes from the ground up, and then the next one is from the sky down. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but that you have to be careful with that because it sounds suspiciously like naturalist folklore that's something that's cool to say, but nobody really checks. But maybe somebody here with physics knowledge can check into that for us. But I, my understanding is, yeah, that there's there's this first little uh, a first little find your way bolt that gets from place A to place B, and then the rest of the energy just charges along that. Okay. That's great. Yeah, that's it. it is is it uh is, is was that a uh, lightning bolt during today's class? No, no last night. That, that was last night. Very cool. That's really fun. Definitely keep doodling. Uh, yeah. Have you uh, seen your uh, been out to visit your your pigeon friends recently? Eh, not recently. <laughs> the um, be uh, interesting to see after kind of giving them a little bit of a break when you go back and take a look at them see if there's any kind of fresh eyes that you have in your head that you might notice something about this thing that you've already noticed so much about yeah i've been curing most of the time <laughs> um instead of nature journaling um, ah. yeah all right well it is it's really good to see you again yeah you too Thank you. Well, thank you. And with that, my friends, we're going to call this round of the uh, Ask Jack to a close. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and wit. And um, stay curious. Um, my challenge for, for folks is to let's think a little bit about kind of our emotional experience as we are out nature journaling. Um, as we use, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of to kind of look out at the universe in front of us and record what we see and we notice. You can also use that same tool and turn it inward. What do you notice? What do you wonder? What does that remind you of? About that own conversation in your head, in your heart, how does this make you feel? Those are things that, um, <clears throat> that you can also include in your journal. Um, perhaps that's through um, adding a little morp in the quarter or Kevin, <laughs> you know, Kevin's or morps can uh, sometimes help us um, help us be able to, uh, you know, start to to get those reflections reflections down and um, bam. Oh, darn, I thought we could catch you with balls in the air. Ah, I saw that juggling. Oh, there we go. There we go. And that's how we end our show. So um, everybody stay on an interesting part of some growth curve, be vulnerable. And, um, you know, if what you do is juggling, then you turn around and you are a juggler. Take care, everybody. Thank you.